Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Jason Moore, welcome to the Susan Rubel Recap Duocast. Well, thank you for inviting me back, Brian. I, I appreciate it as always. Well, I wouldn't have it any other way. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. It, it, this is a lot of fun for me. Yeah, I look forward to it. It's, it's kind of like a rhythm that we get into. We crank out an interview. We put a lot of hours into making sure it sounds great, getting the show notes right. Yep. We launch the episode and then go right into our duo cast recordings. And the, the duo cast is a nice way to just have a check-in with my friend Jason. Right. It's same here. I, I like to check in with you, see how you've been doing, and just talking about previous episodes, upcoming episodes, and just whatever. So before I forget, how is my bass guitar doing? You've been babysitting that bad boy for a few weeks now. Uh, it's doing really well. It's, it's put away in his little case right now, but I have taken it out and, and did some slapping of the bass Yeah, a little bit. How'd the slapping go? The slapping the bass? Uh, it's going <laughs> pretty good. It's a nice sounding bass, dude. I mean, you can't go wrong with a Paul Reed Smith. Yeah, I was shocked to actually find a Paul Reed Smith bass. I didn't know they even made bass guitars. Oh, yeah. I would think that just like any other guitar company like Fender or Gibson, there's there's bass guitars in there somewhere. But yeah, you're right. You know, you don't think of Paul Reed Smith as a bass guitar. I, I think of uh, Carlos Santana when I think of Paul Reed Smith. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah, those birds. The birds on the fretboard. Mm-hmm. Great tone. So what'd you think of the Susan Rubel interview? Well, I thought it was a pretty good interview. I mean, again, you have someone who is super knowledgeable in the film industry, but this time we talked to the executive director of a film festival, Aspen Film Festival, and this is someone who has produced several films and has this background in the film industry that is just super rich with experience. So I'm glad that we're able to sit down with her, that we were able to sit down with her and hear about her journey and hear it from the perspective of a film festival director this time. To be honest, I really didn't know what to expect from this interview because I've never talked to a film festival director before. I've always thought that film festival directors were kind of this elitist type of person that is, you know, probably independently wealthy and, mm -hmm. you know, trust fund baby. <laughs> and, you know, they, they have this festival kind of like as a hobby and they rub elbows with all the film industry folks every year. So that was my bias going into the interview. And what I found was Susan came up from the bottom, literally. I mean, she started in the PR department in Manhattan right out of college. That's right. Of an advertising agency and then was like moving print around the country and was just working her way up through the industry until finally she landed at Paramount and a London-based company. And ended up as executive producer on some really major films, Maggie's Plan and I'm Still Alice. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it's called with Julianne Moore. Yeah. But she won an Oscar for that film. And so it was nice to actually hear what an executive producer does because you see that on the film credits. Right. Executive produced by and then produced by. Well, what does produced by mean? What does executive produced by mean? And so we got that insider knowledge about kind of the lingo and the roles behind the scenes. But then we also got to hear about the three different film festivals that come out of Aspen. And I got to participate in the Aspen Shorts Fest, right? Yeah. which was fantastic. It was awesome to be able to see the shorts. I didn't get to see all 80 of them. I only saw maybe eight or nine of them before I interviewed Susan. But there's this whole world of short films that is happening. And very few people get to see them because they show at festivals. And where do they go after the festivals? They're just now starting to get a platform, a streaming platform, to be able to see those films. Mm -hmm. And so we talked about that and access to those films. But uh, Susan was fun to chat with. And, and we're going to stay in touch. And hopefully, hopefully, I'll be able to go to Aspen and participate in one of their three festivals that they put on every year and maybe meet up with Susan in person. You know, another thing I found pretty interesting, and this has just happened recently, I didn't even really know much about short films. I didn't really know that those sorts of things existed until we talked to uh, Keith Thomas, wasn't it? Yeah, who did The Vigil. And did The Vigil and did Arcane. Mm -hmm. 
And I didn't know, I didn't know that short films were a thing, really. I didn't think people, I'd, you make a film and it's six minutes long or 15 minutes long. That's kind of cool. I guess a lot of filmmakers make shorter versions of their films, maybe as a sort of like a business card Mm -hmm. to kind of get people interested in it and then maybe expand on it later. And then I think there's a thing with short films that some people make short films. That's an actual thing now. So I agree, Jason. I didn't know a lot about short films until. I started interviewing filmmakers on this podcast and Keith Thomas was one of the filmmakers that really opened my eyes to what a short film can do with Arcane, that horror film that he directed. Mm -hmm. And as you know, it's a six minute horror film. And how can you scare somebody in six minutes? How can you tell a complete (laughs) story in six minutes? But he does it. And what was so strange about seeing the short film Arcane on YouTube is that when I went on to YouTube to look for his work and I found Arcane, I think literally there were 300 views on that video. Right, yeah. 300 views. But that is the film that got him consideration to direct The Vigil. And that is also the film that kind of was his entree into the big studio consideration and how he got connected with Blumhouse And ultimately, to become attached to direct Firestarter, the Stephen King novel that was made into a movie in the 80s with Drew Barrymore and is now being remade by Keith as director. That's so amazing. Isn't it? It really is. So another thing I wanted to talk to you about, Jason, is that I know we've talked a lot about BJ Thomas and ever since he was diagnosed with lung cancer, we had a couple of duo casts where we talked about that. And uh, of course, we interviewed BJ back in September of last year. But after he passed away, the response that we got to that episode back in September has just been amazing. The outpouring of support for BJ and the love for him and his music as expressed by the folks who are going to the YouTube channel and watching that interview. It's had thousands and thousands of views since his passing. What has been more amazing is the fact that folks are actually commenting on the video and talking about how much they miss BJ and what he meant to them and their musical world. Yeah. And it's it's just really cool. I, I know it's it's sad to lose somebody as iconic as BJ and as humble and as uh, fantastic of a man he was and performer. Mm-hmm. But it's also really cool to kind of remember him through his fans that way and to see all of them show up in one place, the YouTube video, and to uh, talk about their love for him in that forum. I think that outpouring is going to continue for a while as fans of his are looking back on his career and searching for interviews and videos of his music. I think BJ is one of those singers and performers that just about anyone can appreciate and listen to and enjoy. You know, you don't have to be into one specific genre to appreciate BJ Thomas. He's pretty much across the board when it comes to the world of music. He's been creating this music for over 50 years in several different styles. And I just think that when you say the name BJ Thomas to just about anyone, they're going to mention or start to sing one of his songs. Right. And even if they don't know the name, they know the song. They know the song. Yeah. So if you say, you say, hey, BJ Thomas, you ever heard of BJ Thomas? And you you might get some folks who say immediately, of course, I know who BJ is. Mm -hmm. But Some people might not know the name, but when you say, hey, you know that song, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head, yeah, or Hooked on a Feeling, or Hey, Won't You Play Another Somebody Done Somebody Wrong Song, Uh instant recognition of those songs. Absolutely. And not only that, but you have an instant connection to a memory of some kind with those songs. Oh, yeah. And for me, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head conjures up a memory of the movie Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, which was one of my all-time favorite films, especially in the Western genre Mm -hmm. with um, Paul Newman and Robert Redford. Awesome. But there's a scene in that movie where Paul Newman is riding a bike. Mm -hmm. And I think it's raining outside at the time, but he's riding a bike in a circle in the dirt. And there's this love interest there and they're looking at each other. And I think that that is perhaps one of the first music videos (laughs) and started and it really did i mean you look at this scene and it's very much like a modern day music video but 
that imagery and that emotion and that moment in the movie, and of course, in you know, an Oscar winning movie for me is a, that strong connection that I have to that song and to BJ. And then one of my all time favorite songs that I grew up listening to because of my parents who had the album was Hey, Won't You Play Another Somebody Done Somebody Wrong song, which I try to play on my guitar, but right. I kind of butcher it. So I just leave it to BJ to do. <laughs> Well, you know, I have a very similar memory from that song, and it takes me back to being probably eight, nine years old, maybe. You know, my dad used to listen to the radio in the garage when he would work on his cars, and he would flip between the country station and the pop station that we had on the AM dial back in those days. And, hey, won't you play another Somebody Done Somebody Wrong song was a hit then Mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah. And so I, I remember it being played like pretty much every day for, <laughs> you know, or several, a couple times a day, maybe. So yeah, I have an attachment to that song as well. And I listen to the oldie station here in town in my car and they still play BJ Thomas on there, a couple of his songs on quite a regular basis. So nice. I, I get to hear BJ at least once a week. That's awesome. I know we talk about BJ a lot on this show, but yeah, he, he really deserves the recognition and the attention. Oh yeah. It's an honor to have him in our catalog and have his story out there as told through that interview. Absolutely. I agree. You know, Jason, I wanted to give a shout out to one of our listeners. Okay. We got an email from a guy in India. Hmm. His name is Vibhavi. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, Vibhavi. But he sent me an email through my website and here's what he said. Hello, my name is Vibhavi and I want to become an actor as I had a passion of acting filled in my heart. I am from India and I want to work in Hollywood. Hmm. And I forwarded that to you the other day and I told you that I wanted to talk about this on the duo cast for a reason. I think it fits really nicely within the theme of this show, which is, you know, the title of the show is Dream Path and everybody has a dream, a creative dream. Mm -hmm. There's always a creative thread in people's psyche and there's just an innate need and desire to create something, whether it's painting or drawing or singing or visual arts, performing arts, everyone has some part of that in them and uh, they're hardwired for it, I think. Mm -hmm. I think so. And it was really heartwarming to see an email like this come in, even though, of course, there's no way that I can make this happen for Vibe Javi. But the fact that he is putting this out there and he's emailing a podcast called Dream Path that's about the arts and is about chasing your dreams and how to make that happen is really touching that there's a community of folks who are putting those dreams out there and they're sending them to me. And it just feels like an honor. So I wanted to give a shout out to Vibe Javi and talk about it with you. I thought that was really nice that he contacted you and was uh, telling you that. I'm not sure how we can help. You know, there's got to be a way we could direct that to somebody, but who? And so um, the fact that he, you know, listens to the podcast and chose us to contact, I, I think it's an honor as well. I think that he has a dream, like we all do, to be a creative, um, just like you and I. You know, we're creative musically, and, and I think he probably really does have a passion for acting, and maybe he's an actor in India, but wants to get into Hollywood. And that's, that's a tough one. You know, that's something that a lot of people try and don't succeed at, but some people get in there and they find the right niche and they become a very well-known actor or creative in that business. So I wish him the best. You know, I've said this a few times on the podcast, talking to guests, and I think talking to you on the duo cast, in my opinion, the first step to moving forward toward your dream, your creative dream is to say what it is. What are you looking for? And not just say it quietly in your brain, but to put it out there in some way, whether it's in an email to someone like me or to a friend or to a family member, and to actually say the words, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think that's important is it creates kind of a vision board effect where if you put your goals out there into the world, even if you're just saying them verbally, to a friend, or you're writing them down in some way, like Vibhavi did with this email, mm-hmm. you are creating a map 
you're creating a blueprint that will allow you to keep your ear to the ground and to listen for opportunities and to just be aware of the opportunities that are around you to be able to move that dream forward. So I think this is a great vision board style way of articulating that dream and making that dream happen. Yeah. It's like you got to plant the seed. You know, you have to plant the seed and you have to start physically moving towards that goal. You have to kind of, I, I, I think what he needs to do, and I know this is, this is tough for a lot of people. It's expensive, but he's got to get to LA. He's got to get here. Mm-hmm. And well, that, that could be a tough road. That's a tough road. Yeah. I think that's true, but there's also the first step that you have to take, which is articulating that dream. And that's what I did with my podcast. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how I started it is I started talking about it with other people right? and talking about it with friends and you, you get that feedback. And I think what he's looking for here is maybe some feedback from me, which I'm doing now on the duo cast. So hopefully by Bobby is listening, right? but yeah, you, you start that dialogue and then you can take further steps to crystallize that dream. That's true. Hey, Ryan, I have a question for you. Okay, hit me. How did the Moby interview go? Well, there was a, a lot of buildup to the interview because Moby is a big guest, mm-hmm. an important guest. Right. And I have had a lot of respect for Moby since the beginning of his career. I've listened to his music. I followed all of his collaborations, his music videos. And of course, I watched his documentary a couple of times, getting ready for the interview. I've listened to his album multiple times. So anytime there's that much buildup to anything, doesn't matter what, what it is, something's going to go wrong. <laughs> and of course, something did go wrong. My Wi-Fi went out about eight minutes into the interview <laughs> and I about lost my mind. And I, I was thinking that the whole interview was shot, but Moby was so kind and humble and you know, was not a diva in any way about it. He just kept saying, hey, you know, it's, hopefully you can get this figured out and okay, I'll wait until you can restart your Zoom. And uh, we got it restarted. And thank goodness we didn't lose any audio. We didn't lose any video, but it was a little embarrassing. (laughs) It rattled me somewhat, but we got the interview done. It's in the can. And I think it went pretty well, aside from the Wi-Fi outage. Well, the reason why I asked you that is because I already knew the answer, um, because I've been editing the Moby (laughs) interview. (laughs) Okay. And it, it was truly, literally an oh shit moment. Oh God. I mean, Uh. I could hear the fear in your voice. (laughs) I could hear that you were, I I felt for you. Yeah. I I got a little flustered myself going, oh shit. You know, that is not good. Yeah. Uh, You know, but you were able to reestablish uh, a signal and connection and get on with it. And it turned out to be a really cool interview. So uh, good job for sticking in there and figuring it out and not losing your, your fucking mind, you know, because <laughs> dude, you know, you had Mo- uh, Moby on the other end. He was such a calm person. You know, he wasn't like, he's very chill. You know, he wasn't like, Oh fuck this. I, we'll just, you know, forget about it. Right. You know, he was, he stuck with it and you guys got through it and it was a pretty nice interview. Really? You, thanks for saying that Jason. His publicist was on the zoom call during the interview and she messaged me privately after the uh, Wi-Fi went out and we got everything reestablished. She said, we still have a hard stop at 145. Mm-hmm. So basically she's saying, I'm not giving you more time just because you had technical problems. <laughs> right. I was like, fine. Okay, let's get to it. So we jumped right back into it. And, and I think we got a pretty good comprehensive interview. It was like 45 minutes long, 40 minutes long. Mm-hmm. And normally my interviews with someone like Moby, I could go like an hour and a half easy and still not cover everything I wanted to cover. But he was very kind, very generous with his time to give me 45 minutes, super busy interview schedule promoting the Moby Doc, which is fantastic, by the way. Okay. A really intriguing film about his life. And uh, also his new album, Reprise. He calls it Reprise. You can pronounce it Reprise, I guess. But it's a fantastic album with some collaborations that are really surprising. One of the collaborations is with Mark Lanigan and Chris Christofferson singing a song, a Moby song. Wow. And you know, Mark Lanigan, my listeners may not know exactly who he is, but he's kind of famous here in the Pacific Northwest. He's formerly of the Screaming Trees, and the Screaming Trees are part of the fabric of the grunge movement. I mean, they're part of the deep, deep history of grunge music in the, the 80s yep. in Washington State. And Mark 
ended up having a problem with heroin and going uh, solo after he became clean and sober and has had an amazing solo career Mm -hmm. ever since then. But, and then Chris Christopherson, of course, everybody knows. Oh yeah. Me and Bobby McGee and you know, all of the songs that he's written and performed over the years and the movies he's acted in. Gosh, all the collaborations on the Reprise album, just amazing. So fun to talk to Moby about it. You know, if, if I haven't intrigued you with just telling you that the Moby Doc is great, let me give you a little story from the Moby Doc. Okay. One of the stories that Moby tells is a clean and sober story. And it's a story of when he was still drinking and had a pretty big problem with addiction. And uh, this is in the documentary. He says that uh, he was on a tour bus and he woke up in the morning after a night of having sex with multiple partners, uh, none of whom he knew or remembered. And when he woke up that morning, he was covered in poop (laughs) and he had no idea, (laughs) no idea whose poop it was. (laughs) And that was... To, to say that's a dark moment in his life is kind of an understatement. Oh, my God. <laughs> but it's one of those bottoms. And you hear about folks that are in 12-step programs talk about the bottom, you know, kind of bottoming out. Yeah, hitting bottom. And that was one of the bottoms that he mentioned. And there are quite a few bottoms, actually, that he's had in his life where <laughs> some, some, some dark, dark moments where you realize that it's it's not all fun and games in the entertainment industry, and it's not all rainbows and unicorns when you're using and you're perhaps driven by ego and you know considerations of fame instead of the art itself. Right. And that's really one of the messages of the film is that the search for meaning is uh, it's a complicated one and can be derailed when you are focused on fame and money. And Hmm. you're also, you know, saddled with addiction issues and that type of thing. So it was a lot deeper than I thought it was going to be in terms of like what I was expecting from the documentary. And I highly recommend that folks go out and rent it. It's on Amazon Prime and wherever you can rent movies. I'm going to go check it out. Uh, I've been a fan of Moby for, oh, probably, gosh, 25 years, I think. Yeah. The first time I ever heard Moby, it was Natural Blues. Mm Mm-hmm. And it was a video, a very interesting video that kind of portrays the end of his life happening right before him and just reflecting on his life and uh, dying, basically. So, right. Yeah. It's, you know, that kind of stuff. I, I really like that kind of music that he creates. You should check out the natural blues version that's on the Reprise album. He's got two new artists that he redid that song with for the reprise album and it's fantastic there's a music video that goes along with it too nice yeah so uh, what do we have coming up next jason well we got um moby coming out next week and then we have an interview with monica nevy that needs to come out so oh yeah we got to get some episodes launched here i think we're getting backlogged a little bit we got to launch monica's interview maybe as a bonus episode yeah maybe we could do that yeah Either way, it needs to come out in some in some way or another, you know. So yeah, and that's a good interview. It's a good interview. So yeah, that was fun. Yeah, and I've got a couple of interviews I've got to record here next week. I've got one with Mark Pickerel of the Screaming Trees. Right, wrote songs and performed with uh, Mark Lanigan back in the eighties, but now he's got his own gig. Right on, Mark Pickerel and his Praying Hands. Nice, and of course Tommy Chong. Oh man, you're finally letting the cat out of the bag. Tommy. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, <laughs> I've seen him. He's been on Rogan. He's been on Stern. He's been on Steve-O's podcast. And he is an interesting guy. You're going to have to really like come up with some good questions for him. He's got a really interesting outlook on life and spirituality. And of course, he's, you know, as you know, he's got his own brand of marijuana and talks about smoking it a lot. So mm-hmm. he's not, you know, when you think of Tommy Chong, a lot of people think he's just like this burned out hippie stoner. And he's actually a very smart, intelligent businessman and has a, has a lot of interesting views on the world. So I'm looking forward to that. Well, for my listeners who are interested in Tommy Chong's career or his work after comedy, anything he's doing now, go ahead and send me an email through the website, brian at dreampathpod.com. Mm-hmm. Or you can uh, connect with me on social media at dreampathpod on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. Send me a message. And uh, let me know if you have any particular questions you want me to ask Tommy. And if I ask one of your questions, I will try to give you credit for that question. 
And i um, looking forward to getting that interview recorded so that we can launch that sometime in probably mid to late July. Perfect. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Well, Jason, it's been fun connecting with you again. And one thing I wanted to mention before we signed off. Okay. I have a homework assignment from my voice coach. Oh. I have a voice coach named Claude, and I take voice lessons with him. Okay. His homework assignment to me this morning was email Jason. <laughs> And he made me get this email drafted on the Zoom call with him. Hmm. He's like, all right, here, I want you to type it up. Hello, Jason. I want to play music on the weekends, hmm. and I need a bass player to do it. Okay. Do you want to jam with me for four hours on the weekend? <laughs> I haven't hit send yet on the email, but I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to give you a heads up that you're going to be getting that email probably in the next day or so. Okay. Yeah. No, uh, yeah, I'm, I would I would love to get together and play bass. I don't know about committing to the full four hours, but I mean. We can start with an hour, see how it goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm totally game for that. Sounds good, brother. Looking forward to it. I mean, I have your bass. I might as well bring it back <laughs> and use it. So yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Let's make it happen. Let's do it. All right, brother. Have a great weekend. You too, Brian. Thank you. Hey, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path.